I wanted to talk about the release of the CAS report. Now, the CAS report came out. It didn't really tell us sitting around this table or many of our viewers things that we didn't already know, but I think it's interesting to go for its findings and then see the reaction to it because you're going to be seeing now that this sort of landmark report has come out, a lot of backpedaling on the transgender issue. Ah. I am going to attempt to be as diplomatic about this as possible for the sake of remaining on YouTube so we can keep the word out about this, because I think it's very important to share the information to make sure that people do not get away with the positions they were saying up until two days ago, which has measurably harmed quite a few children. Now, I feel sorry to interrupt the video, but I just want to direct your attention to the aesthetics range of merch that we have on the store. These are beautiful images that I think work really well as posters or mugs. So if you want to support us, going over to the merch store at shop.loadseater.com is easily the best way other than signing up on the website. This is the report itself. Uh, you can go and download the PDF of it. I thought I'd give some summaries from here. For those who don't know outside the UK where this has been a big issue, the original report was commissioned by NHS England in September 2020 after the Kira Bell case from the Tavistock Clinic that said that they were putting kids on a pathway to receiving puberty blockers and cross-sex hormones without adequate therapeutic vetting beforehand. The interim report was released in 2022, and the findings were so damning that it led to planned closure of the Tavistock Clinic in 2023. This was the sole gender identity discovery service clinic in the UK. It was set for 2023 <coughs> closure, and it was then elongated to start setting up two regional satellite clinics in the Northwest and in London. So Tavistock closed on the 1st of April, ironic, and those two clinics have since opened up. Sorry to report that people involved in the failures of Tavistock have since been appointed the heads of those substitute clinics, so I won't hold my breath at things being fixed to help these vulnerable children. NHS accepted the findings last year and have since implemented them in March, preventing the prescription of puberty blockers to vulnerable young children, except in the case of clinical trials. And I think, unfortunately, we're probably going to see the numbers of clinical trials start to rise. So among the findings, which were once dismissed as conspiracy theories, as we who have befriended transitioners or you know, read Hannah Barnes's book here well know, um, it's unpopular to be right, but it turns out we were, the sort of 4,400% increase in the last 14 years of adolescent girls identifying as having gender dysphoria was not a purely organic phenomena. It was a subject of multiple comorbidities, including uh, autism, suicidality, familial abuse, especially in care homes, things like that, which is quite distressing. So again, we knew this. We were talking about it. You were shut down. For yeah, I remember uh, when um, when I was in high school, in secondary school, there was this girl. I was in the um, in like the teacher's office, like having a strop about something dramatic, and there was this girl who brought a knife into school. Um, and we had this conversation. She was telling me all about her problems with like her stepdad, like all these kinds of issues. She said she was like a lesbian, all that kind of stuff. A year later, um, I go back to this um, this teacher, and she's there again. But now she's a he, and he wants to start this like LGBTQ plus club. And the people, the students in that, again, you could tell they were coming from troubled backgrounds, and these kids need support. They, but instead, we're telling them to chop off the genitals pretty much yeah you've been you've been funneled into a uh identity based social group which overlooks the social circumstances which may have led you to identify with that in the first place which unfortunately does entail a lot of familial abuse uh, it is important here actually cass does use the term social contagion she doesn't use the term rapid onset gender dysphoria developed by lisa Littman. so i think she's trying to play a middle ground here mm. and not adopt the terms of people who have been categorized as TERFs or on the right who have been right, right about this issue. She's trying to avoid politicized terms. It's but so course. crazy, but it's common sense, though. Like, I can't believe it's controversial to say these things, that you should be seen as like mentally ill if you want to chop off your genitals. Like, how is that controversial to say when you actually get it like down to what transgenderism is? Like, how, how do we allow this? How, how is this acceptable? It's, it's not particularly kind to these vulnerable people, no. So in, in here it says, the systematic review showed no clear evidence that social transition in childhood has any positive or negative mental health outcomes. No negative mental health outcomes of social transition in childhood. I mean, maybe they're doing it proportionally. They began at a fairly low position of mental health and uh, it doesn't seem to make it better or worse. Yes, and or also... double down as well, like if you go for all this stuff. Mm. 
like maybe you sort of have to like cope. Yeah, it's kind of a sunk cost fallacy, yeah. isn't it? Well, especially when the overwhelming number of people seen by the Tavistock Clinic that were socially affirmed then went on to take cross-sex hormones and then went on to take puberty blockers. Whereas if you let them watchfully wait without any social intervention or social transitioning, the detransition rates are between 60 to 90%. The average age is, average rate is about 80% from the studies that, that I've seen. Um, relatively weak evidence for any effect in adolescence for social transitioning. Those who have socially transitioned at an earlier age and or prior to being seen in the clinic were more likely to proceed to a medical pathway. And it also said, the review has heard from GPs who have been put under pressure to continue prescribing such treatments as puberty blockers on the basis that failing to do so will put young people at risk of suicide. So there is emotional blackmail within the institution yeah. that prevented a bunch of people yeah. coming out and whistleblowing. So some of Cass's recommendations for policies have included a, quote, holistic assessment for children presenting <clears throat> with gender dysphoria, so that's screenings for other mental health conditions. We know that from the Tavistock's internal report from Hannah Barnes's book, it was conducted in the 90s before, there were a lot more cases. It was five to six other mental comorbidities went along with gender dysphoria, so just treating that doesn't allow those to be addressed. Um, it urged the clinicians to ensure that Quote, when families are making decisions about social transitioning, it's important parents are not unconsciously influencing the child's gender expression. Look out for Munchausen by proxy syndrome, funnily yeah. enough. But also, even when the parents are against, like, I remember reading Time to Think in Hannah Barnes's book, and wasn't there, like, a case of this kid who just wouldn't, like, shower or something, and he was taken in by the authorities, and the mum was like, no, he, he just has an issue of, like, OCD or autism or something. And they were so insistent to try and make him trans that they were trying to, like, separate him from the mum. Yes. Like, that's so insane. Yeah, it's it's very cruel. Also, Munchausen by proxy syndrome, ironically, was a phrase coined by John Money. Oh, really? Yeah. There's a little bit of universal irony happening yeah. there. Uh, she also said the NHS should implement a full program of research for effective care for gender distressed adolescents, such as uh, this is an area of remarkably weak evidence, and yet results of studies are exaggerated or misrepresented by people on all sides of the debate to support their viewpoint. Trying to be very middle of the road. The reality is that we have no good evidence on the long-term outcomes of interventions to manage gender-related distress. Um, also recommended that children not be given puberty blockers or cross-sex hormones outside of those clinical trials. Watch out for the numbers of clinical trials that are going to be happening. And that all children should be offered fertility counselling and preservation prior to going to a medical pathway. Fertility preservation. What do they mean by that? That means freezing your eggs or freezing your sperm. Yeah. But how as like a young person would you be able to know whether you want kids or not? Like, I'm sure a lot of these young people probably don't want kids and then they'll probably later regress it in later life. Also, also it's not a guaranteed process. No, and it's no. also introducing more technological pitfalls for going down the pathway of having children in future, which inflict unforeseen costs both on the children and the prospective parents. So yeah. it's not not very good. And she also called for a clinical detransition protocol because that doesn't exist, despite the detransition rate cited by one of the Tavistock clinicians being 30%, not 1%. So 30% of their patients who discontinued treatment are just not being serviced, which isn't very good. So this is why the NHS is now set to review all its transgender treatment protocols. Uh, Rishi Sunak has welcomed the recommendations, highlighting the sharp rise in recent years in children, particularly adolescent girls, questioning their gender. Now, this report only applies to England and Wales because NHS Scotland is a very different thing. Scotland are currently trying to make all of the recommendations that CAS made, like the complete opposite, currently in law. So they're trying to oh, lower really? the age at which people can get cross-sex hormones and, and mm. gender surgeries. Um, obviously, the permeable border between England and Scotland, I wouldn't be surprised if people just stop yeah. travelling upwards, which is worrying. But none of this paints a picture of how bad it was at Tavistock. So as I've referenced Hannah Barnes's book here, here's the original article. It's linked down in the description. I also recommend getting her book. Um, from her book, Tied to Think, I've just pulled out a few extracts just to illustrate the picture to our viewers overseas. The rate of the gender identity discovery clinic referrals were increasing for years at a rate of 50% per year since 2009. And we're now arriving at a rate of more than 100 per month in 2015. It was almost impossible to process them. Over the course of 2015 and 16, referrals doubled to 1,419. Between 2009 and 2015, Gid said no to just 2% of those referred. So they weren't turning away many of the patients. They were diagnosing gender dysphoria in the majority of the patients, despite the exponential rise in identification. Mm -hmm. And no alarm bells were raised from the top. They were among clinicians, but those were silenced. The number of girls seeking help had equaled the number of boys for the first time in 2011. Its caseload had been nearly three quarters male for those referred in childhood, or two thirds overall. Referrals for natal girls made up 65% of the total by 2015. In 2019 to 20, girls outnumbered boys by a ratio of six to one in some age groups, most markedly between the ages of 12 and 14. This is after the advent of smartphones, 
unfortunately, you may be able to corroborate, some adolescent young girls are led astray by social contagion. I do think it's also guys as well, though. Like, I have a friend, and over lockdown, he's always, he's always been a bit been a bit strange, like, been a bit like of an outcast, um, and bullied at school and all that kind of stuff. Like, I remember in year <coughs> five, um, we went on a school trip to, like, France. Um, I didn't go, but my friends went. And apparently he tried to kill himself in year five, and it's like, this is probably, like, what, how old are you in year five? Like, nine? Yeah. Yeah. Like and he's already having these thoughts. And then lockdown happened. And then he came to me, we were at the bus stop, and he was just like, oh, I think I'm <coughs> confused. And I was like, what, what do you mean by that? He's like, I think I'm gender fluid. I was like, okay, what, what do you mean? And it was like, I don't know, I'm confused. It's like, surely if you want to change your gender, you should have a firmer grasp of what that actually means. Mm. And he's doubled, down to, he's doubled down on it now. Um, he goes by a different name. He has like this, like, bio of his like gender and pronouns and all this kind of stuff it's really weird and this is like this is my friend this is someone who needs this help and he's being failed by our institutions he's being failed by the schools and probably if he went to Tavistock they probably wouldn't question it when all he needs is his support yeah I, I, I had someone close to me who came from an abusive home was using transgender ideology to essentially escape themselves because they blamed themselves for having abuse inflicted on them by family members. And they said, if I would have been given medical transition, then this would have put me on a path that I could not have averted rather than address the issues that are afflicting me and in my own household. So mm. to cover up for that is, is just wrong. In 2012, a, a caseload review found that the associated difficulties included with this ideology, uh, non-suicidal self-harm, suicidal ideation, suicide attempts, autism spectrum conditions, ADHD, and symptoms of anxiety, psychosis, eating disorders, bullying, and abuse, among other things. So that's exactly what they're overlooking here. And in 2015 to 2016, there were more than six times as many young people referred as featured in the review that they've just cited. So those were the issues before the exponential explosion. So you think this would probably alarm the clinicians that were working there? No. They might want to alert uh, would, the authorities? I wouldn't think that at all, because what I think that they think is that what they're dealing with is a political constituency that isn't self-replicating, and so they need to recruit into it. That is certainly the case for some of the heads, definitely. Um, I would just think, though, considering this is now irrefutable evidence, the fact that these kids have also got unaddressed abuse issues, mm. you'd think now that that's been brought to light. If not for pure self-preservation, you would go for it. Well. If you look at the CAS report, in it, CAS teamed up with the University of York to attempt to run a study on the patients at Tavistock since that audit, so an updated one, and it was stopped because, and I quote from the CAS report, conduct of the study was contingent on gaining access to the relevant patient data and securing the full cooperation of the gender identity clinics. The research team contacted clinical leads at GIDS and each of the adult gender identity clinics that worked with Tavistock. Negotiations took place between August and November 2023, after which six of the seven adult identity clinics declined to support the study. They just chose not to. Yeah. The reason, they cited, was the difficulty of this gathering data. This is going to be ruinous to our case. Yeah. So they said it was too difficult and too costly to gather the data. However, again, in Barnes's book, we do know that even in court proceedings, when they were asked to hand over documents, they said, we don't have them. And then it later turned out they did have them. They knew they had them and they just didn't want to turn them over. So there is an institutional cover-up conducted by certain people within Tavistock here for ideological and financial gain. Yeah. Certainly. But we have a comment from Cass actually printed in The Guardian of all places. And this is what I mean by the fact that this has reached a fever pitch and now it's undeniable. And Cass said, it was under, uh, unbelievably disappointing that the research study she'd hoped to conduct to look at the outcomes of 9,000 former patients been blocked by the clinics. The former health secretary, Sad Javid, changed legislation to allow researchers to link pre- and post-transition NHS numbers, because this was previously prevented. But the research had to be abandoned when all but one of the clinics refused to cooperate. Cass said, I do think it was coordinated. It seemed to me ideologically driven. There was no substantive reason behind it, so I can only really conclude that it was because they didn't feel that it was the right thing to do to try and nail down the data. Oh, the reading the spot on. What a, what a surprise. Yeah. Now, for once, for once, the government's actually going to take action on this. Oh, wow, really? So this is the health secretary, Victoria Atkins, and she met with Amanda Pritchard, who's the chief executive of NHS England, and she told her nothing less than full cooperation by those clinics in the research is acceptable. Writing for The Telegraph and explaining what she's going to do. She said she's had enough of a culture of secrecy and ideology over evidence and safety. Um, Sajid Javid told the Tele Telegraph, despite it being the unanimous will of Parliament, it is a clear vested interest have 
deliberately frustrated the important data access legislation that he brought forward to support Dr. Cass's review. A no holds barred government investigation must be launched into this obfuscation, documents retrieved, and if necessary, individuals held accountable for failing to provide records. I know he has to say if necessary there. No, this should come with criminal penalties mm. because you have confiscated in some cases the lives or at least the potential to have families from multiple children. If you're now withholding the documents from that, well, uh, that's nothing less than contemptible and should be legally held as such. Now, if you want to know who was behind this, um, here are some of the names you can blame. Uh, this comes, of course, from Hannah's book and also this helpful Mail Online article with lots of photos. Let's scroll down to Polly Carmichael. She's like the arch villain of the Tavistock Clinic. So she was the director of GIDS for multiple years. She oversaw lots of failings. She Mm. aided, at least. She denies it, of course. She aided in uh, discouraging whistleblowers from coming forward. So, for example, in 2021, social worker Sonia Appleby, who was head of safeguarding at Tavistock, won £20,000 in damages after being shunned when she raised concerns about puberty blockers. Um, throughout Barnes's book, Carmichael denies doing this, but we have lots of corroborations. Uh, Carmichael blocked the implementation of the findings for, of a review by Dr. Femi Ngezu, which recommended that GIDS needed to, quote, take the courageous and realistic action of capping the number of referrals immediately. This was years before the Kira Bell situation brought yeah. this to light. Uh, in 2016, an internal study by Tavistock revealed puberty blockers were increasing suicidal ideation in patients. So under her watch, the new puberty blockers are making kids more suicidal. Uh, Carmichael made no changes to the protocol. Um, clinicians have also testified under oath that Carmichael herself personally intervened in cases where children were showing significant distress to causes other than gender dysphoria <clears throat> and insisted on giving them puberty blockers How anyway. could you be this evil? Like, I, I don't understand the mentality of someone like this. It's very devouring mother energy. Um, she once yeah. went on CBBC and told an audience of children that puberty blockers were wholly reversal as well. So she was just insistent on getting the message out there to impressionable kids. Yeah, yeah, just persistent liar. Yeah, quite. Yeah. Um, so sort of Cruella Deville sort of figure here. Yeah, quite. Uh, on the claim, there was the uh, the dark joke in Gids. Do you remember there'll be no gay kids left by the time we're done? Yeah. Um, the clinicians that reported this were Matt Bristow and Anastasis Spilaldis, and both of those are gay men. And they claimed that Polly Carmichael had implied that because of their sexuality, they were unable to be as objective as a heterosexual member of staff. So they were raising concerns about gay kids being transitioned when they were gender confused because of their sexuality or budding yeah. sexuality rather than their sex. And Carmichael said, um, yeah, you're at risk of dismissal if you complain about this. Amazing. Yeah, not 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 good. Uh, despite a round of sacking, she retained her job until she could have her sock shut. Uh, she got a 80 grand payout. Of course she did. And she's now head of the Great Ormond Street London Satellite Clinic. So after all these failings, she's now head of one of the regional clinics they've set up instead of Tavistock. It is amazing that these people just fail upwards, isn't it? Yeah, it's it's, it's genuinely evil. It's like they want yeah. to continue this happening to kill children. Uh, this article also... But well, they absolutely do want to. They yeah. do want to. Well, I'll I tell you who definitely... No question of it. Uh, down here is Dr. Helen Weberly, right? So Helen Weberly and her husband are head of Gender GP. Now, this is where the former head of Mermaid, Susie Green, slunk off to. And Polly Carmichael used to have Susie Green come into meetings. And there was, they, she denied this existed, but then a Freedom of Information Request turned up a 3,000 email chain with her and Susie Green. Uh, Susie Green having taken her teenage son at age 14, I think, to Thailand to have gender reconstruction surgery, where Susie Green was lobbying to have the age at which cross-sex hormones could be lowered to below 16. Right. Um, this woman now works with her. And she's now the leading provider of puberty blockers in private practices. Ah. Because this guidance only applies to NHS England. If you go outside and pay for private practices, you can still have kids prescribed puberty blockers. Uh, in 2018, she was convicted of running an independent medical agency without being registered and fined 12 grand. In 2022, she was suspended by the Medical Tra Practitioners Tribunal Service over a range of charges that included to fail to provide good care in 2016 for three female patients, aged 11, 12, and 17, who were transitioning to being male. In its determination, the panel found that 36 allegations, including failing to provide adequate follow-up care to a 12-year-old who was prescribed testosterone, were proved. Um, a year later, the suspension was overruled by the High Court, so she's just allowed to practice. However, her husband was removed from the UK Medical Register in another tribunal in 2022 because he committed a catalogue of failings, that's a direct quote, in relation to his care of seven patients between February 2017 and June 2019. One was aged nine years old, with another, a teenager, killing themselves in the months that followed. So these are the people that are going to be in charge of trans-affirming care in the UK from now on. I think, therefore, flat-out bans and criminal investigations must start. Politicians are guilty too, though. This is the purpose of this segment. Don't let the memory hold their own record. Because as of two days ago, this was all okay. It was transphobic bigotry to suggest otherwise. And then as soon as the cast report comes out, the Labour Party get on the media circuit 
And uh, I'm oh, just... Oh, really? Yvette Cooper's just... <laughs> oh, listen, let's listen to Yvette Cooper for, for a minute, yeah. shall we? How could we be giving kids puberty blockers for 20 years? I know this is very troubling. The report is very clear that children and young people have been badly let down and have been receiving <clears throat> treatment that's not based on evidence. Oh, so I think I the CAS review is really important. We welcome it. Labour accepts all of its recommendations. I think they should be implemented now as swiftly as possible. And we would like to work with the government on doing that. And what would you like to say to those um, doctors, clinicians, um, who felt that they couldn't speak out because if they did, they would be victimised? Well, I hope that this report really is a watershed moment for the NHS, for NHS gender services, <coughs> because this is, it, the, the report's clear, it's basically talking about evidence, focusing on evidence, focusing on children's welfare and not having all of this get caught up in, in culture wars or in different kinds of uh, those debates, instead be able to... I'm going to pause that there before I punch the screen. Um, yeah, to, just to be clear, the Tavistock was set up under Tony Blair in the Lib Party, right? No. No, no, it's when well older it? than that. It's, is it? Yeah, late 60s to the 80s. Or is the, is the, has this been... Uh, You're thinking the Gender Recognition Act of the right, Settlement okay, Tony yeah. Blair, which right. then instantiated it in law. Right, okay. So, just to, just to it's think... It's not like she hasn't been a part of this, is what I'm saying. But her husband, Ed Balls, goes on Good Morning Britain every yeah. pretty much every morning and argues with the TERFs and gender-critical types and traditionalists and parents who bereaved of their children because yeah. they were swept in by this ideology and calls them transphobic bigots. Um, Annalise Dodds, the Shadow Women and Equalities Minister who's still sitting in Cabinet up until two days ago, has suddenly become very quiet, was lobbying to make it easier for children to access this. Her entire party, other than Rosie Duffield, and I have mixed feelings on Rosie personally, but she was treated very badly by the grassroots activists and fellow MPs for being the only person that was saying, oh, maybe we shouldn't go down this road. And now that this evidence has become popular to talk about, even though we had all the evidence for multiple years and multiple people were talking about it. And now if you didn't, why were, you, why were you doing anything if you didn't have any evidence that it was going to do anything good? It got us insufferable. Yeah, it's contemptible. Um, uh, also, Shadow Health Secretary, future Health Secretary, probably, uh, given the polls, Wes Streeting, um, himself a, a gay man, so, you know, not very wise to be backing the Tavistock Clinic there, has also repeated the line, this can't be swept up in a culture war. Wes, um, what you were dismissing as a culture war about two days ago and will continue to dismiss for other issues was the entire reason it led up to this point. Mm. All the whistleblowers were dismissed as culture warriors. All of the gender-critical feminists who were worried about being assaulted in toilets were dismissed as culture warriors. And now, suddenly when it's become a peak public salience and too costly for your career, you've jumped on the bandwagon and have moved the dialectic across to let this fall out of the culture war to make yourself look better. I hate this as an excuse as well because of the culture of Tavistock that was the problem. Yes. Mm. Like, okay, yeah, no, there's a massive problem with the culture there. Yeah, yeah, so there should be people fighting against that culture. In a culture war. Culture wars are a good thing. If the culture's bad, what do you want? Yeah, quite. And as much as I will say there have been some conservative politicians very good on this, Nick Fletcher, Miriam Cates, Liz Truss, etc., the Conservative Party are equally as guilty quietly this week. Head of the publication of the uh, CAS report, Rishi Sunak has killed his conversion therapy ban, which would have banned therapists from affirming the biological sex of a child in therapy and instead set as legal precedent, the only true therapy to be mm. affirming the gender identity. Quietly, he's killed that off. Mm. Because for, for anyone who doesn't know, uh, the government was committed to doing a draft bill of this. It was expected in a prior King's speech, but it, it wasn't included, um, thanks to I think, Danny Kruger and the like pushing it out. And it was meant to be put through in January, and now it's not going to be put forward to the Joint Committee because folks like Kemi Badenoch has done something useful for once and told him, this is going to be terrible for you. And yet again, now the CAS report is out. It's so costly, they've just quietly slunk off. They're going to pretend that they never endorsed this. But they did. Both parties did. And so they're equally liable for every single kid that has been mistreated by Tavistock. If you appreciated that episode from the podcast of the Lotus Eaters, you can go to lotuseaters.com to get access to all the premium content that's on the site, such as the Epoch series, this episode on Michelangelo Part 3. If you'd like to find out what else is being put out, you can follow on Twitter at lotuseaters underscore com on Twitter. Thank you and goodbye.